So I understand the value of uh, Keyside lands to be approximately uh, $50 million per acre. Has Waterfront Toronto made this figure public? Yes, the, um, the threshold issues, uh, the letter that we published, um, does make the $590 million for the Keyside property um, public. Okay. And um, just a, a question on, on public access. There's a lot of, a lot of public money here. And uh, the Auditor General points out that much of the, if not all of the consultation, unless I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, has occurred uh, at the waterfront and not outside of the waterfront. Am I correct in saying that? The auditor raised a very good point to remind us that the waterfront belongs to everybody. It's not just to the waterfront. Um, and so with Keyside, um, our most recent round of consultations, we um, made extra efforts to make sure that we consulted outside of um, the waterfront. We held seven um, pop-up consultations at libraries across the city, um, only one of which was in the waterfront. We um, held four uh, sessions, uh, lengthy sessions, two of which were outside the waterfront. So roughly two-thirds of the consultation that we did in our most recent round um, have been outside the waterfront. And we do take that very seriously. It is important that other people in the city and in the province feel that the waterfront belongs to them as well. So, so the concern with that would be that not enough um, uh, concern would be shown for public access to the waterfront. And I think that's something that uh, obviously concerns the public. Can you speak to uh, what steps you've taken in the consultation process to make sure that um, you know your 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 plans take uh, public access into account? For the can, waterfront? can I just to clarify? Are you talking about physical access or access to information? You mean Physi actually getting to the waterfront? Physical access. Yes. So um, Waterfront Toronto worked with the city on the um, central waterfront secondary plan, and one of the four key objectives of the um, secondary plan is um, improving north-south connections and being able to bring people back down to the waterfront. Um, so we're working on that. We're improving um, underpasses. We're working with Metrolinx, the city, and others um, to try and improve those connections. Um, as George will tell you, we are working very hard with the city, um, the province, Metrolinx, IO on um, expanded transit to the waterfront. And we're creating parks and public spaces that we hope will attract people down to the waterfront. Um, Sugar Beach is a perfect example. If you Google Toronto these days, one of the first images that comes up is of Sugar Beach and the pink umbrellas. And that hopefully people take pride in and say, that's my city and that's my province and I want to go down there and, and participate. We also have a number of um, functions that we participate in. We created uh, an annual event during March break called Sugar Shack, where we make uh, maple sugar or maple syrup um, treats. And lot, I think we've had 50,000 people attending that over the course of a long weekend. So um, it will be part of the, of the uh, consideration. Absolutely. Going forward. OK, and just switching gears for a moment, um, something that raised alarm bells for me in the report was that there were a uh, sale of lands to uh, supplement the operating budget. Um, can you comment on w whenever I see assets being sold to to supplement an operating budget? Um, you know, can you can you talk a little bit about the lands that were sold, whether there was fair market value got for those lands, and who they were sold to? I'm I'm going to ask Lisa to come back up. Or? Yeah. I'll get Lisa to come back up, but uh, I'll just provide some general context. So when we were established, we had the original uh, $1.5 uh, billion of seed money, but it was also uh, part of the original design that we would generate additional revenue through the sales of those properties that were de uh, designated to us to help continue to develop uh, the properties. Uh, so it was embedded in the direction of government right from the beginning. But I'll let Lisa speak to the specifics of the properties and the fa fair market value issue. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, yes, all sales of land that Waterfront Toronto has brought to market have been at fair market value. We typically would do that through a request for proposal process with developers where we go out to market with our specific um, requirements and objectives with respect to sustainability, affordable housing, design excellence, and we evaluate those uh, proposals and then award on a basis of financial criteria as well as those other elements related to sustainability, design excellence, and affordable housing. So 
in terms of the lands that have been sold so far, they're all publicly owned lands, either um, primarily actually by, owned by the city. Um, Keyside is owned by Waterfront Toronto itself, so that will be, as you know, brought to market as well, and that will be through um, uh, competitive procurement and um, at fair market value. Okay. And uh, with respect to the uh, to the RFP um, for the the proponents. Uh, the procurement process. You stated in, in your opening, Mr. Diamond, that it was, uh, I think you said, fair, open, and competitive. Um, but, but there seems in the Auditor General's report an indication that there was more, um, Sidewalk had more information than other proponents. Would you say that that's accurate? Well, first of all, the, the RFP was run by a separate steering committee, so I don't have to be able to comment on, on that uh, directly. So I'll have the staff again um, uh, deal with that. But um, I do want to point out, and I, I think it's important that um, uh, the process was uh, thoroughly reviewed uh, by uh, Mr. Justice uh, Osborne, who was a former Supreme Court Justice and the Integrity Commissioner uh, for the Province of Ontario in terms of the fairness. And he did um, comment that he felt the process what, that was followed uh, was perfectly acceptable and appropriate. Um, and uh, also, uh, I understand, did have the opportunity to review the Auditor General's report and and confirmed his opinion back to us. But in terms of the way it was handled, uh, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to our CEO. Yeah, my understanding is that um, all of the information that was shared with all of the uh, uh, proponents uh, was basically publicly available. So there was nothing shared with Sidewalk that wasn't shared with others. They may have asked questions for documents uh, that were already publicly available and we provided that. But there was no additional information provided to Sidewalk that uh, others weren't either available to them or uh, given to them. Um, the auditor would like to comment on this. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I would like to comment on this. I think uh, during our process, you know, I'm not aware of what the justice looked like, uh, looked at, but in terms of our own process, we did do quite in-depth work at looking at what documents each party received. And I would stand behind the fact that Sidewalk did receive many more documents than the others that were part of the process. You're right, some of them were public, um, some of them were open data, some of them were asked for and received on request. I think the key point in our report is that um, typically what we see in an RFP process or an even when it's narrowed down to um, lesser number of people getting sub uh, substantial information, we like to look for consistency. So that if somebody's getting information, that same piece of information then is offered up and provided to everybody that's part of a bid process. And that way you know for sure that everybody is working from the same information. So what we saw is we saw different parties receiving different pieces of information. Sidewalk definitely received more. And we would probably like to see that everybody who was part of this process at the beginning when they narrowed it down to the five, and then at the end when they narrowed it down to the three, um, I'm sorry, down to the five and then down to the three, would have received the same information to make sure that nobody was operating under different assumptions. Um, and that, you know, so I, I would say we reflected in the report quite accurately, and I, I have uh, no knowledge of what the justice did or did not look at. Okay, does that satisfy that question, MPP Birch? Are yes. you going to continue on? It does. Do you have a clarification, Ms. Davids? <coughs> or did you want to address? Just a minor clarification, um, <laughs> and I agree wholeheartedly with the auditor's assessment that um, materials, um, once we started the RFP process, needed to be um, equal to all parties. They absolutely were during the process. The period of time in which um, documents were shared differently with different um, people was during the market sounding process. That was before the RFP was issued. Um, and Sidewalk got some information. Other bidders got different information. There were some people who got information who did not decide to bid. Um, that was all happening during the market sounding period. Once we were into the RFP period, we had a data room that was uh, carefully monitored. Every, everyone had access to that. Um, any uh, questions that were asked were answered to all bidders at the same time. Um, and we followed that process very, very rigorously. But during the market sounding period, we did provide 
um, a variety of information and um, we have a new protocol in place to track um, all materials that are given to any bidders in market soundings to ensure that um, everyone gets the same thing and um, the same amount and are treated exactly the same way during the market sounding periods, including the amount of time that we spend with um, I think we, we were with 52 different companies and organizations. Um, we will be monitoring going forward. You know, if so-and-so gets an hour, everybody gets an hour, and, and making sure it's fair that way. So just to clarify, I think what the, the Auditor General is saying, and I've been, I have some experience with procurement, if, if a proponent asks for some information and you provide that to them, then you have to provide it to everyone. And my understanding is that that, that did not actually happen here and that's what the Auditor General found. Yeah, I, and I, I agree that, that in the market sounding period, nobody was a proponent yet technically because we hadn't issued the RFP yet. So we, we have protocols now in place to make sure that during the market sounding um, period of time, which is before an RFP is issued, um, that we follow those guidelines and we sort of apply the same thing that we would during the RFP. But br during the RFP, we are um, absolutely follow the letter of the law. Does the other general care to comment on that? I would say that a lot of the information that was provided during the sounding period did provide an advantage to the recipients because they had more information before the RFP was put out. Having said that, I do appreciate that during the RFP process the information was more managed. But um, leading up to that, there were different pieces of information provided to different parties. So their starting point was, was different. Do have any time left? You still have two minutes, almost three minutes left. Okay, I'd just like to ask one more question, which is uh, there are a lot of money changing hands, and we've seen that, that the staff complement of Waterfront Toronto has increased with, uh, you know, money coming from, uh, from uh, Sidewalk. And I'm wondering what kind of hiring practices you have and what kind of, um, you know, um, what kind of policies and procedures that you have for hiring new staff, seeing that you're, you're getting money from this, uh, you know, through the RFP process um, for new staff? I believe there's 70 staff now, am I correct? A number of them would be dedicated to, to, to issues on <coughs> sidewalk? Yeah, uh, I think we're probably uh, around 80 now. 80. Um, but. Uh, I, I know we go through competitions. Some of these are uh, consultants. Some of them are, are uh, temporary. But uh, I don't know, Meg, if you can speak to the ones that you hire. Is it mostly competitions, or do you headhunt as well? For very senior positions, we will headhunt. Um, uh, for Keyside, we hired a number of contract positions, most of them more junior. We have one sort of senior. Most of them more junior um, staff to help out on the project. They're contract positions because if the project doesn't go forward, then their contracts um, will have to be reassessed. So we were very temporal in, in our, um, our hiring. And just to be clear, um, a, a large measure of those new hirings had to do with the Portlands as opposed to Keyside. So our staff complement is you know, not just Keysight. We have lots of people working on it. So would you call it open and transparent? So if someone asked you how you came to hire a particular person, since it's public money being used, that, that you Yes, I would say so, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I was just going to comment, since I've been there the four months, the uh, competition, I know the hirings that uh, occurred during that period were through competitions, open competitions. Thank you. Okay, you still have a minute. Are you good? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in earlier comments, uh, you confirmed again that the only acreage in play is 12 acres and that if anyone wanted to go beyond that 12 acres, there would be a new procurement process, that the one that's taken place will not allow any proponent to go past the 12 acres. Is that correct? Yeah, and I'm going to just answer that one. I, uh, during that process, when we were doing um, the threshold issues, I asked the city to be very clear on their expectations on any properties beyond the 12 acres. They're very clear that that would go through a separate procurement process, so there was no overlap. Uh, now, Sidewalk or others could uh, apply to that, but they'll have to go through a different procurement process. But they can't use the one that's already taken place that's to go that's, beyond the 12. That's correct. That's, correct. that's capped. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That uh, concludes that 20-minute question set for the official opposition. Now go to the government. MPP Parsa, are you gonna complete your question set? Thanks very much, Madam yeah. Chair. Appreciate that. Yeah. If you don't mind, I want, I want to go back to the value for money uh, question that I asked. We didn't get a chance to finish, so um, I want to hear. Well, I'll, a good 
is a good for the taxpayer. Um, <laughs> I, I do believe that it is, uh, it is um, uh, very good for the taxpayer because when you look at the history to date, not only have we returned uh, every single dollar that's been given to us, in fact, a, a little bit more, but as a result of that, you now have the waterfront being developed, which is creating additional economic opportunities for the taxpayer. And so I believe what's occurring to date um, is, is definitely uh, in the taxpayer's interests um, and in the province's interests in terms of, of, of the work that's being done. Okay. Um, given that this um, re revitalization initiative is one of the largest uh, in, in, in the world, um, and I, I, perhaps the, even the deputy, if you don't mind, if you can chime in. Uh, I want to know how we're supporting uh, this initi initiative for Toronto. So, I mean, anybody can. Ontario's a bit su support of this uh, project, in particular the province. Um, so, I, I'm just trying to get. So it's it's a three it's a three level yes, it's government. Three it's, level. An it's an it's an initiative right. in Toronto. Yes. And. Um, it's a huge uh, initiative, one of the largest in the world, and in particular, like, what's our, uh, what's the provincial role? How is our, how are we supporting this? So, first of all, you know, relating it back to your value for money, yeah. and building on what Waterfront's already talked about in terms of the collaboration between the three levels of government and Waterfront, which is key, and the application of expertise in terms of assessing and evaluating the various proposals that Waterfront is doing. We're in close contact and there are um, timely briefings in terms of what Waterfront is bringing to the table and our own, and our own uh, evaluation of it in terms of um, bringing to bear expertise that's outside of Waterfront Toronto. So think of it as a third party triangulation where we're getting information on all the, uh, on all the aspects of what Waterfront Toronto is putting forward. Uh, whether it's Keysight or any other proposals for that matter. And in addition to that, the three levels of government are looking at their own sources of expertise and bringing that to bear to inform uh, Waterfront Toronto in terms of its, uh, of its activities. And in that sense, I think we're, we're embellishing and enhancing the support that we provide to ensure that we're the, the organization is meeting its objectives. So it's a strength and oversight it's bringing uh, the appropriate expertise to bear when it's needed to bear and, um, and, and making so sure that uh, you know, we're, we're providing that in a timely manner to, to Waterfront Toronto. So it isn't that we're absent for long periods of time and then we connect. The ongoing uh, relationship that we have is something that we would, we would like to stress and that we're proud of in terms of being able to work with the organization and the other three levels of government. Okay. Um, the, sorry, I apologize. Uh, if I can just add, and, and the chair raised this in his opening remarks, when you look at our history in terms of these types of investments, uh, we generated you know, $10 billion of private investment over that period of time. We created huge, uh, beautiful new parks and public space like sh uh, Sugar Beach and Corktown Common. We created residential and commercial spaces, including affordable housing. So these are great economic benefits, huge employment opportunities in terms of jobs. Uh, as we pointed out, depending on the nature of the innovations, not just jobs in Toronto, but jobs up north and throughout Canada. Uh, and much of the investment that we've made today, uh, when we talked about some of the investment Sidewalk has made, actually uh, a lot of that investment has gone to Ontario companies who are doing uh, consulting work, um, additional, uh, even our consultations, we hired a facilitator from here. So it, it lands here in the economy and our past has actually demonstrated great value for money uh, from the investments of government. Okay. Out of the, um, the 2.75 billion, um, how much of that has been a, since the inception, so since the beginning, how much of that has been um, the province's contribution? So it's a third. Okay. The province, given that it's a trilateral agreement, the funding okay. is a third, a third, a third between us, the city, and the, uh, and the federal government. 
next. So the initial one, the initial but investment was 500 million. Perhaps let me just elaborate a little Sorry, bit more. Yeah. So there's uh, so there's two major phases on the revitalization. Phase one, each government committed 500 million for a total of 1.5 towards the first wave of Toronto waterfront revitalization, which resulted in the completion of the Pan Am. Uh, and Parapan Athletes Village, in addition to several parks and, and other public spaces. So that's phase one. Phase two, the three levels of government committed 1.185 million, of which the province is providing 400 million, to re-engineer the mouth of the Don River and the Portlands to protect the 290 acres, hectares I was talking about, or 715 acres of land in the southeastern portions of downtown from, uh, from uh, flood risks. Uh, which will enhance and, and open up uh, the potential for residential and commercial development. So you've got two numbers there, total 1.5 and 1.185, of which the province provided 500 million for the first phase and 400 million for the second phase. So you're looking at a close to about a billion million. dollars. That's the province's portion. Yes. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, how much time has passed? I just want to make sure I, I give sufficient. There's still uh, just six minutes. Just, oh, no, 13. 13, 13 minutes, minutes, sorry. Um, here, I'll come back. Why don't, why, don't, why don't I go? Let's go to MPP Hogarth. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being here today. Just uh, following up on my colleague's question about, so it's about a billion dollars that the Ontario government uh, gives. Uh, just. You know, checks and balances and transparency and accountability are so important to our government and, and pretty much all, anyone who runs for elected office. A dollar, every dollar spent is a taxpayer's dollar. So what are the checks and balances you have in place um, so we know where this money is spent and, and, and we know that there is value for that money? Let me, let me start off with that. So as I've mentioned before, it's a trilateral oversight committee. Um, I think you'd be interested to note that since the creation of Waterfront Toronto, there's been 48 audits to ensure that it achieves its legislative uh, objectives and delivers value for money. Uh, in addition to the uh, Ontario Auditor General report in 2018, there were 16 audits conducted by the three levels of government. And in addition to that, Waterfront Toronto has conducted 32 third-party audits. So uh, with respect to ensuring that there is um, an appropriate level of oversight, I think, I think those stats speak for themselves. In addition to that, the monthly meetings that the Oversight Committee has with Waterfront Toronto provides the three levels of government the opportunity to dig deeper into particular issues. And the one that um, I think we're all uh, very much uh, interested in is the ongoing pros uh, progress around the Portlands project because as we as we explained earlier on it is a key strategic foundational piece that everything else rests on because it will open up the development uh, the eastern part to the eastern part of this uh, the city in a substantial way so t uh, if I may just sum up two things audits can this is an ongoing process in terms of the oversight. It isn't, uh, what you have now is a snapshot in time, and the philosophy of, of the province is very much ongoing improvement. So we're constantly looking at ways to improve the way that we do oversight, and uh, reports like the Auditor General's 2018 report provides us with additional direction for us to improve what we're doing. So it's always ongoing. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, just a clarification, uh, MPP Hogarth from the auditor. Thank you. Bonnie. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, with respect to, um, I just wanted to comment on the monies going through uh, from the province, the Fed and the city. We have a figure five in our report, and it talks about what the intended contributions to Waterfront were. And the total um, committed was $1.5 billion by the governments. The actual amount that went directly... Um, for waterfront use was 822 million, uh, the province 177 million directly. So there were two tranches of money that were provided uh, to other agencies for other projects. So the actual direct use by waterfront was for 177 million. So figure five just, just uh, demonstrates the amount of money that was actually 
um, available to waterfront for use. Um, I just wanted to comment with respect to the 10 billion figure. Um, we have that quoted in our report, and in our report we talk about it. Um, a consultant was hired in 2013 to look at the, the 10 billion and to see how much of it was attributed to waterfront and uh, found that they couldn't, um, a part of it might have been attributed to waterfront, part of it likely was, but a lot of it was the development that was happening, residential and commercial in Toronto. So we couldn't tie exactly the impact of waterfront uh, into the, into the, um, the economic quote of uh, $10 billion. Uh, with respect to the audits, um, a lot of the, uh, we've reviewed all the audit reports that were done. A lot of those audit reports were the financial statement financial statement audits, um, but the, but it is, there were the odd one that we looked at the operations. So when we, um, we did our work, uh, our work reflects, um, there's nothing different uh, that we found in any of those reports that wouldn't be reflected in ours. So um, we had taken them into consideration during our audit. Okay, thank you. Do you want to continue, MP Hillbrook? Sure, did, did you want to finish? Just on the, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just on the issue of the value, I, I'm not going to challenge uh, the, the Auditor General in terms of some of the other assertions, but the Corktown Common that I talked about uh, was a project that we helped support in the design, and that actually released uh, some of the value for the West Onlands um, and uh, for the East Bayfront that um, is in that $10 billion figure. So I think, uh, you know, the point is there was major economic activity that uh, occurred as a result of the investment that the three governments made in the uh, uh, Corktown Common project, among others. All right, thank you. Uh, one other question. Do you set goals and benchmarks for, for just to, to determine for the public, for the public money, if, if a, a project was valuable at the end of the day. So how do you set those goals? Is it part of your mandate letter? Is it something that's public that we can see that in so many months it should generate X or economic uh, activity? How, how do we as a public know that this money is being spent? What is the, what, how would you, how, what were your metrics around that? So I, I'm going to let Lisa Taylor speak to this, but uh, as was identified earlier, we have 30 metrics that we've agreed on with governments in terms of what we we're going to be reporting on. Those were recently reported both in our annual plan. Um, so we will continue to report on the progress in the annual plan. It was also in our five-year strategic plan that was released publicly. So the intent is to report on that publicly, but I'll let Lisa speak to these. Thanks, George. So uh, George mentioned in our, in our plan we have 30 metrics. And in terms of those 30 metrics, um, these relate to performance measures that, um, as per the Auditor General's report, she recommended that we have a performance measurement framework that's linked right back to our legislative objectives that are in the Toronto Waterfront Revitalization um, Corporation Act. So we've done exactly that. And one of the areas of, of the 30 per, uh, performance measures is on fiscal responsibility. And we have three key metrics under that. One of, that re one of those relates to um, competitive procurements. So we have a performance measure around uh, the percentage of contracts that we award that are competitively procured. That's for us is a key um, value for money uh, metric and I'm happy to report in terms of our results for last year we were at 99.6 percent um, competitive in terms of the contracts that we awarded and they were in the hundreds of millions. The other two metrics on um, fiscal responsibility relate to on budget performance for our projects. As you know we're an organization that delivers projects and so we have a metric around our um, performance on delivering projects on budget or within 5% of budget. And in the last five years, our results have been 95%. And then our final metric is on, uh, is related to our ability to deliver projects on schedule because if projects are not delivered on schedule, that also costs more money as you continue um, drawing out the length of time of a project, you have to carry the overhead to manage that project. So we have a metric related to that, um, and we will be reporting on, on that in our next annual report next year. One, one further question before I pass it off. Um, again, account accountability and transparency. How does Waterfront Toronto consult? And I know, I know MPP Birch talked a little bit about consulting with the public. So how do you, how do you consult with the public and how do you get feedback from them on some of the projects that have taken place so far? And is that documented? Is it public? So in terms of performance measures, we have about five or six related to um, public consultation. 
Um, I cannot recall them all off the top of my head, but I know one of the new ones we put in was related to the percentage of um, individuals that we engage and consult with that are outside of the waterfront um, geogra geography, which was in direct um, response to the Order General's recommendations. Um, but we are we're planning and, and um, have the objective to be much more transparent in terms of our public engagement. And as I mentioned, there are a number of performance measures about that now in our um, strategic plan and our annual report. So is there an opportunity? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just comment. Um, from the beginning of the establishment of the waterfront, I would say Waterfront uh, Toronto has had a uh, stellar reputation of actually uh, consulting with the public. It's been one of the strengths. Uh, we can always uh, look to improve, but if you look at even the consultation, the, the amount of consultation both online uh, and in person that we've done on these projects, uh, I would challenge uh, other agencies to show uh, that they've done more than what Waterfront Toronto has done. Do you uh, do follow up with the public after these projects are implemented? Is there a follow up with the public on asking, engaging them on what their thoughts are? Good value for money? Um, I should get somebody who's been here longer on the uh, on the issue of uh, the follow up, but uh, I can tell you even on follow ups uh, from the initial uh, uh, consultations that we actually had on the threshold issues, um, some of the initiatives that we put into our uh, uh, alignment discussions with uh, water uh, with um, sidewalk was actually from the consultation it did not come actually from uh, Steve's letter back on the threshold issues it came out of the consultation we've incorporated that both on the land value issues but also uh, Christina Werner would point out uh, on the privacy discussions a number of the issues that were raised in public consultations were the issues that we incorporated into our discussions and will go forward if this project goes forward right. thank you Thank you. Um, now, MPP Crawford. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for everyone for being here today. And uh, just following up with what MPP Hogarth was uh, talking about, um, I was particularly interested in the performance measures and pleased to see that there's some improvements in that respect. Is there anything with respect to timelines? Like, I know we talk about on budget and getting things done, but like, what, you know, what's the timeline for all this project? Well, there, there are definitely timelines, but um, and I can ask um, yeah. our managers to come up and talk about Yeah, them. I'll get David to come and speak to the timelines on the big project uh, that we're doing, but uh, it, that we do assess timelines and some of the reported stats that we've identified, but uh, the external risk, uh, risk management company that we've hired to actually report directly to the board on some of these issues, timelines is one of the issues. It's budget, timelines, uh, scope of the project. So that gets reported directly to the board, so it's not just our staff opinion as to whether we're on time uh, or whether we're projected to be on time. And that's what those uh, simulations that I talked about earlier was their projections as to whether we think they think we'll be on time. But I'll let uh, David Kusturin maybe uh, speak to some of the discussions on how we're monitoring the performance and timing. Uh, you just have under two minutes under this question set. Uh, very quickly then, the um, Portland's flood protection, the timeline for that project is to be uh, substantially complete construction um, in 2024. Although the project will continue through 2028 uh, as we have obligations to governments to monitor the work that we do uh, environmentally. Um, the, we do quite a number of projects. Uh, on an annual basis, uh, and they're in various states of delivery, everywhere from um, early design to design development, construction documents through construction, uh, and projects that are in closeout and commissioning. Um, often the timelines are actually dictated by either our development partners um, who have us or, or would like us to do work that's um, uh, in concert with the work that they're doing, or it's uh, the timeline is dictated by the City of Toronto uh, based on their needs. So we generally have to work on an annual basis with uh, both our private sector partners and governments to reestablish and reconfirm timelines, and then we will uh, set our schedules to match those timelines. And where are you at right now relative to when your organization was created in terms of, you know, what the initial thoughts of where you'd be to where you are today? Uh, well, we've invested... Um, more than the uh, 1.5 billion um, in government money. There's a little bit of city uh, funding from the initial tranche uh, to be reinvested. Uh, we are, um, 
our organization is identified to uh, continue through um, uh, 2023 and then to 2028 uh, under our legislation. And uh, I'd say that we are um, just about right where we should be uh, in terms of what we've delivered to date. Okay, how much time is? Ten seconds. Well, <laughs> but you know what? I'll come back. I'll come back to you uh, in the last. Second. So now the official opposition has seventeen minutes, and then the government will complete their seventeen minutes. Okay. So moving over now to MPP Tavins. Great. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just following on from earlier questions, we talked about the twelve acre twelve acre cap on land accessible through this round of procurement, this RFP. Uh, I think it was you, Mr. Diamond, who earlier said that. Legal documents have been exchanged between Sidewalk and Waterfront Toronto recognizing that 12 acre cap. Could we have a copy of those documents? Yeah, they are. It's publicly uh, available. Um, and uh, I'm sure we can have a copy sent directly to you. Okay. That that would be very useful. Uh, next question The City of Toronto owns 1.5 acres of land on Quayside. Uh, Excuse me. Thank prior you. to allowing the sale or sale, lease, or use of this land, council must approve a business and implementation plan. Will Ro Waterfront Toronto wait until council has approved a BIP prior to moving forward with a board vote on the MIDP? Um, you're correct, absolutely. We have to prepare a business and implementation plan. The city's expecting that from us. We've been discussing it for quite some time. Um, and the city did allow us to um, contain, uh, uh, include the 1.5 acres, I'm not even sure it's that much yet, but um, of their site in the RFP. And so um, I think it's fine for the board to go ahead and vote, uh, although it is a caveat to Sidewalk Labs that um, it's up to the city to approve that, uh, that uh, business implementation plan before anything can be transacted. Um, but I think it's fine for the board to go ahead and, and have their vote. The city has also indicated that they will not do any work on their consultation or taking anything to um, council until Waterfront Toronto's board has voted. So if I understand you, your, your board, Waterfront Toronto, may well hold a vote saying, yes, we would approve this agreement, but it would not come into effect until after the city had held its vote and approved the use of the land, approved the uh, business implementation plan that had been put before it. On the, on the city's parcel, that's correct. So. And I assume the city's parcel is going to be necessary for anything to actually really go forward. Is that correct? Um, in my opinion, um, I think that you can have a, it's, it's not a huge piece of the property. It's actually fairly small. Um, I think that you could do a successful project without it. That would be up to Sidewalk Labs to determine if they want to continue on if they don't have that piece. Um, certainly Waterfront Toronto um, has the other two larger parcels and we feel we can do independent um, developments on those, so that would be um, up to Sidewalk Labs if the city decided not to include those lands. In any event, Sidewalk will not be able to use the city land until it has correct. voted to accept that BIP. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, in the Auditor General's report, uh, page 691, she wrote, we found internal Waterfront Toronto emails indicating the board felt it was being, quote, urged strongly by the federal and provincial governments to approve and authorize the framework agreement with Sidewalk Labs as soon as possible. Can you tell us which representatives of the federal government were sending emails or other communications to the Waterfront Toronto board saying, get moving on this? My understanding is that the email um, that's being referred to is an internal email at Waterfront Toronto, so I don't know, um, I have no knowledge of um, any communication coming from the federal government. Um, what I do know is that email um, indicated that the federal government was looking to um, schedule, the uh, Prime Minister was coming into town for the 17th of October and then not again until November, and if it was at all possible to do the 17th, that would be um, great, but it wasn't to um, hasten signing of the framework agreement, it was to schedule a date for an announcement. And it was really about coordinating schedules um, for the Prime Minister, the Premier, and the Mayor, as well as the head of, of you know, one of the largest companies in the world. And, you know, that was sort of a, a difficult task to get schedules to combine, and it seemed to combine on the 17th of October. So that's, that's what that email was about. I don't know anything about an external email coming to us from the federal government. Um, Auditor General, can you speak to that? 
Yeah, we do say internal, um, internal emails talk about it, uh, that they were, uh, is it on? Or external emails talk about it being um, urgent for them to approve it. Can you tell us who at the federal government level was applying I, I this don't, request? I don't know, and I don't know if that um, was coming from uh, phone calls. It was obviously not from an email. Um, it wasn't to me, so I don't know anything about that in particular. I just saw, I saw the same internal email as the auditor saw as well. Uh, can this committee have a copy of that email so we can understand the contact? Absolutely. We can provide okay. those. Internal email. I'm sure that legislative research is getting all this down. We are, we are, we're keeping track of all the requests from committee members, and it will be discussed after uh, this Fine. public session. Good. And were there communications from the provincial government as well? Not to my knowledge, no. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, thank you. In her report, uh, the Auditor General talks about concerns on the part of the Intergovernmental Steering Committee. Uh, they express concern about how Waterfront Toronto shared Keyside information with its board and government partners prior to the official announcements. Uh, the meeting minutes of the Intergovernmental Steering Committee stated that Waterfront Toronto needs to give its board and government partners information in advance with adequate time to review materials. Now, we're in a situation where three levels of government provide oversight and governance of Waterfront Toronto through this intergovernmental committee. And given its scope, the Keyside project clearly falls within the intergovernmental committee's mandate to exercise oversight and governance of Waterfront Toronto. But apparently, Waterfront Toronto didn't consult with the intergovernmental committee before it issued the RFP or selected Sidewalk Labs as a successful proponent, signed the framework agreement, or signed the PDA in July of 2018. Why is it that Waterfront Toronto did not, in fact, satisfy those needs expressed by the Intergovernmental Committee? Um, so I don't, I'll start with the RFP. I don't know. I assume that's correct that we did not talk to the um, IGSC um, about the RFP. I wasn't a party to any of that, so I don't know for sure, but I, I was not at an IGSC meeting about that. Um, we did talk to the IGSC. We briefed them prior to the framework agreement and the decision by the board. We did so on a no-names basis because we were in a blackout period, so we were able to say that we had selected a partner, but that we weren't able to tell them who that partner was. Um, and so uh, they felt that they needed to have more information up front. Um, and then on the PDA, I think we had um, lots of discussions with governments on the PDA because we set in place that protocol um, that the board um, requested of us to go to the governments to get all their comments on um, on the uh, any approval that we asked of the board on Keyside. And in fact, we did, did receive comments in writing from all three levels of government on the PDA prior to um, signing it. Is there, is there a problem here at this point in the interrelationship between the Intergovernmental Committee and the Waterfront Toronto? I think we're working very, very well with our government partners. We have regular meetings with our um, uh, assistant deputy ministers and the deputy city manager, as well as regular meetings with IGSC. And I think, George, you could yeah. probably speak to that. So um, in the, in the recent four months since I took over this role, I have attended the Intergovernmental Steering Committee. Uh, no issues have been raised. We've actually shared all the um, status of where we're at with regards to this project, uh, the Portland's project. Uh, I think, and you can ask uh, Deputy Minister Giannakos as well and his staff, I think we've been very open with the discussions. We've answered all their questions. Um, I think, I can't speak for the past, but for the current uh, positioning, I think we're in a very good position. But Okay. Thank you. Um, the Auditor General stated on page 69, 689 of her report that Keyside represents a marked departure from the traditional mixed-use real estate projects pursued by Waterfront Toronto. It raised complex issues involving data capture, governance, and digital infrastructure, all outside the scope of Waterfront Toronto's experience. The uh, Auditor General concluded that Waterfront Toronto entered into agreements with Sidewalk Labs, quote, without sufficient due diligence. And as we've discussed earlier, the full board was given only one full business day to review the framework agreement. 
Before October 16, 2017, did the board consider whether Waterfront Toronto's mandate included developing a data-driven smart city at Quayside and the designated waterfront? I don't know what I'd put in that terms, but I think that it was expressed to the board uh, at the time um, that there was a, an opportunity to move forward and that one of the objectives uh, of Waterfront Toronto was to be innovative in its approach. That's why one of the reasons the government agency was, uh, was moving forward with it. And so we actually felt that um, this was appropriate and was something that would be a very exciting opportunity for the city. As I said in my introduction and where we are today, I'm very pleased with where we are today because I do think this can act as a catalyst to um, lead us to, the, uh, to be leaders, not only in the innovation economy, but in other areas we've already proven to be leaders with respect to a data governance, which there's been a gap. Um, and once again, I think Waterfront Toronto has shown tremendous leadership in, in helping uh, all governments uh, with, with, these, uh, with these difficult issues. Could I please ask you to identify yourself since you're now sitting here? And, and I, I assume you've been called in to address MPP Tavin's question. That's correct. I'm Christina Verner. I'm the Vice President of Innovation, Sustainability and Prosperity with Waterfront Toronto. Um, I wanted to speak directly around the mandate of Waterfront Toronto and our previous experience with regards to digital projects. And Waterfront Toronto, albeit that we've never really focused on a smart city per se, because smart cities are generally driven around the efficiency of municipal service delivery, we've had at our core the notion of an intelligent community development program, which is focused on the intelligent community forums model of how you build complete communities that involve um, enabling infrastructure or the broadband infrastructure, digital inclusion and digital equity, sustainability from a triple bottom line perspective, so environmental, economic, as well as social, the creation of a next generation knowledge workforce, innovation across solutions, policy development and business models, as well as advocacy of how we share best practices and lessons learned with the broader community. This has been a long-standing practice of Waterfront Toronto. Uh, we actually have a, a groundbreaking work that we've been doing with Beanfield Metro Connect since approximately 2008 was the RFP for that around a uh, fiber optic network that was not publicly subsidized that connects every residential unit within the waterfront, including our affordable housing units, at rates which all people will have access to. So in some cases actually in our affordable housing units, they have the, the connectivity at absolutely no cost. Um, we, to an earlier question around the notion of obsolescence with technology, we've even featured in that agreement um, a component of that whereby Beanfield will take and reinvest in the network. So the network has to stay in the top seven in terms of price and performance globally. So they're not just simply mining the profits. profits. And there's actually a return back to Waterfront Toronto on some of the proceeds to help with offsetting the land costs that we would have actually lost in the initial sale of land by requiring that to be included in our development work. Um, we've really focused in the past on enabling infrastructure and creating an environment that's conducive to, to this type of development work. You've seen the success of us attracting OCAD, George Brown College, the University of Toronto, and Mars down to the waterfront. And Keysad was the next stage in this development, and certainly as time progressed, solutions become more complex. And, and clearly with the partner that we selected through the Keysad RFP process, there's a different scale of complexity that gets introduced through this project. I would say that there is a different and, level of complexity. And that's why we certainly added a lot more expertise through our digital strategy advisory panel and our external advisors to add to the skill set that we had internal to Waterfront Toronto on these issues. And, and tell us who were these people um, that you added? Legal advice, intellectual property advice, IT advice. Who were these people? What Ab numbers are we talking about? Absolutely. So our digital strategy advisory panel uh, consists of 15 experts from across Canada and actually internationally that look at issues regarding privacy, digital governance, the notion of uh, data ownership, the privatization of services and how that actually gets impacted in looking at social equity and digital equity. We've added in terms of legal counsel, we have McCarthy's. Uh, we, from an IP as well as a digital governance perspective, there's George Takash and Barry Sookman. We have Tim Banks from Innovation, who's also advising on intellectual property. Chantelle Bernier, who's the former interim federal privacy commissioner from Denton's, who's their global lead on digital governance, as well as Anne Kavuki and the former three-time privacy commissioner for the province of Ontario, are all advisors to Waterfront Toronto. The digital strategy advisory panel is chaired by Michael Geist, who's uh, you know, the Canadian research chair in e-commerce law at the University of Ottawa as well. There was a, a letter on October 31st addressing these matters. How long do you think it will take to design the detailed framework to evaluate any proposal and subsequently govern it? 
The evaluation of the proposal that was received through the Digital Innovation Appendix is part of the, stand, the evaluation framework that we have, that we've established with KPMG. That being said, the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel is an ongoing panel that will be uh, overseeing the implementation should it move forward to that stage of any proposed solution that would happen in the designated waterfront area, not just for the Keyside project. Uh, that framework of evaluation would guide that process. We also, I think it's important for this group to know, are undertaking a human rights impact assessment to assess some of the concerns that have been raised through the public consultation process on things like freedom of association, freedom of expression, access to public lands, um, perhaps restrictions in terms of affordability. If there's any concerns like that that have been raised, that will also be part of our final evaluation Two that we minutes. would be bringing forward. Two minutes. MP. Um, and given our time is short, how do you plan to protect the rights of minors moving forward on this? We have uh, expressly come up with some credential or some clauses with regard to how we would manage protection of minors, parental consent, making sure that their data is actually respected and segregated. Uh, those are things that would be in the next phase of negotiation. Um, Chantal Bernier has been instrumental in helping to define some of those criteria on the basis of her experience as the Federal Privacy Commissioner. And are those criteria publicly available? They will be through our next phase of consultation, yes. They're going to be part of what we're establishing as our intelligent community guidelines, which are additive to our existing environment that we have. Um, so one of the concerns that has been raised is that there isn't necessarily a policy void in these areas, but a bit of a policy frontier. So the public have raised concerns that we feel we can address similar to how we did in our minimum green building requirements around sustainability by having a, a contractual level of obligation as well for any vendor to provide a greater degree of privacy protection here in the waterfront than you would have in any other smart city deployment throughout the world. Um, my time is short. In hindsight, do you think it was appropriate to give the vendor the responsibility to design data governance, such as was outlined in the original RFP? It's interesting that the RFP was interpreted in that way. The, the notion was that the vendor would help to identify data constructs or data ideas of where things ha would have become roadblocks. So I've been working in this space uh, where technology and sort of society intersect for approximately 20 years going back to the first Connecting Canadians program back in, in 1999, um, oftentimes these projects would progress to a certain point and then they would stall. And the issue would be this some misalignment with regards to governance or decision making, not necessarily even a policy piece, but just a governance within the project. So the idea was that we would have public sector and private sector actually at the table to be able I'm to sorry, make recommendations. I'm sorry, I have to stop you there. Sure. But you may want to stick around. I don't know, there may be some <laughs> okay. questions coming your way. Uh, MPP Crawford, you completed your questions? You, uh, yeah, you're clear. MPP Miller, please. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Chair. And I just wanted to follow up on MPP Crawford's question from the last round, where he was talking about timelines. Um, and uh, you, you, you had, uh, you, I think, the uh, one person came up and talked about the uh, Portland's project in 2028 was the date that I heard. And I guess it just sparked the question to me. Uh, is what happens to Waterfront Toronto, in, you know, there's a sunset built in, I think it was 2023, now, now it's 2028. So what happens if, I assume there's going to be ongoing projects in 2028, so what happens at that point in time? Push the seat back to the CEO. <laughs> So in terms of um, Waterfront Toronto's mandate, under our Act, the Toronto Waterfront Revitalization Corporation Act, um, we have a sunset of 2023, which is at um, the government's uh, decision in terms of an early wind-up. They have that opportunity. However, in, uh, in May 2018, when the contribution agreement, the tri-government contribution agreement for the Portlands Flood Protection Project was executed by the three orders of government and Waterfront Toronto, that provided for that project to continue to 2028, which means that the organization Waterfront Toronto does have um, its mandate extended until 2028, assuming governments don't opt for an early wind up in 2023. So I'm aware of that. So my question is, you're not, I mean, there's projects ongoing at that point. What happens? I mean, is it likely then that there'd be a future extension or? If you do wind up, what happens to the projects that are in, in place? So there would be a there, there would be a plan in terms of a business plan of assets and liabilities that we would prepare in terms of uh, basically a wind up plan of the corporation that we would work with governments to determine um, for all those projects that are underway how they would how would they would be sort 
completed in terms of. I assume an option for governments could be that you're extend. seeing great success, so you extend it Absolutely. for another 20 year, 10 or Absolutely. 20 year, 50 yeah. years or whatever. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair. MPP Parsa. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, and I think that perhaps Deputy, again, you might be able to be the best person to answer this. And uh, my question is in addition to what uh, MPP uh, Tavins has already uh, brought forward. And I wanted to talk about the, uh, with respect to the relationship between the Waterfront, uh, Tr Waterfront Toronto and uh, Sidewalk Lab, I want to know what steps uh, has the ministry taken to conduct further study uh, on the issues around digital governance and data privacy? Certainly, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, as you probably know, the uh, Ontario Digital and Data Action Plan, which is going to be released in 2020, uh, speaks to proposed actions focusing on themes related to digital and data issues. Um, and the, uh, the task force that's responsible for this is, is one, of the, uh, one of the task force that we're looking at for expert opinion. What you, what you see is an ongoing engagement on the part of government in terms of looking at and a constant discussion with uh, Waterfront Toronto as they progress through their own assessment of the MIDP. And we provide input based on basically two, uh, two major task forces. The first one has to do with the digital and the data task force. Um, and the second one has to do with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities Expert Panel on Intellectual Property. These two have been set up uh, to work on these issues as a whole, and we're taking advantage of that and ensuring that we're getting input from those two, as an example, from those two task forces to be able to feed into and provide input into Waterfront Toronto. So as the government moves forward on its own policy thinking around these issues, we're taking advantage, we being MOI, taking advantage of the work that's already being done and tying into it to ensure that we're informing uh, the discussions that we're having with Waterfront Toronto at the same time. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair. MPP Crawford, please go ahead. I know that uh, we had, you touched on the consultations um, and you've been encouraging public input. Uh, but I think there's been a concern that a lot of it's been around local residents and you know, what have you done to encourage input from the broader public? Because this is really, I know it's in downtown Toronto on the waterfront, but it's, it's a world-class revitalization that really should benefit all Ontarians. So what are you doing to reach out to people beyond uh, living on, in that area? Hi, thanks. Um, as I think I mentioned before, um, the auditor did raise um, a good reminder um, that the waterfront does belong to everybody, not just the City of Toronto. So um, for Quayside, and I can only speak to Quayside, I know the Portlands, we've done a lot of extensive consultation on that project as well. Um, I don't have that information, but we could certainly get it for you. Um, but in the Quayside um, consultations, we had seven pop-ups um, at various libraries throughout the city, um, from Etobicoke to Scarborough to North York. Um, and beyond. Um, we also held four sessions, two of which were outside the waterfront, two of them were um, within the waterfront area. Um, so about two-thirds of those um, have been outside the waterfront and we've been, we've taken to heart what the auditor said to make sure we go beyond. Are they outside of Toronto's boundaries or like there's other communities that are part of the GTHA that right. You know, no, feel we have a not. Um, connection to my to knowledge, we have gone as far as I think actually Mississauga. We've done um, a consultation there. Um, practicality, cost, etc., probably keeps us a little bit more um, geographically focused. However, all of our um, consultations are streamed live online. We also do surveys online. Um, we put a lot of information on. We send out a newsletter to I think 6,000 individuals across the province. Um, so we do try and reach out as far as we can, but recognizing that we're using public dollars, we're not traveling, you know, to the further reaches of the province or the country. Um, however, we do have people from all over the province. We have municipalities coming to see us. We tour at least once a week. We're running a tour for City of Mississauga or um, City of Ottawa. Uh, officials will come and meet with us and then we'll tour them and tell them what we're working on. Um, and we tour people from all around the world as well. We get um, organizations from Germany and Europe and um, the far, um, like Asia, et cetera, to come and um, look at what we're doing as sort of an example of great revitalization on the waterfront. So we really are trying to be as broad as we can, 
about being respectful of how we spend our money. Okay. And um, in terms of the, the Portlands, uh, I'd just like to ask about the preliminary estimate uh, on the cost of flood protection. Um, in May 2018, the government had signed the joint, with the joint governments to fund a total of 1.25 billion towards flood protection. So uh, the provision for upfront consulting operating other costs is around 453 million, which is about 37% of the projected cost. So my question to you is, that number seems high? Uh, may maybe you could just explain that. The, the soft cost isn't just consulting. The consulting is uh, slightly less than uh, 200 million, uh, including all of our consultants doing design, contract administration, our own project management uh, costs, uh, and other agency costs, TRCA, for example. Um, we pay their costs. The, the larger number includes also costs for um, uh, contingencies, risks, and escalations. Uh, um, so the, while the hard cost itself is in the order of about um, 850 million uh, to 900 million, um, the balance is not just soft cost, it's actually um, factors that are applied to the hard costs to develop the total budget. And would that be sort of a typical number that you would expect? Uh, yeah, it was fairly case? typical, although we, did, um, we didn't just rely on uh, standard benchmarks. We undertook a specific risk assessment and risk quantification on the project to ensure that we had um, done an appropriate uh, level of due diligence on the overall number. Um, and then actually um, uh, through our board uh, and assess the risk tolerance um, from the board as well as governments to establish what the uh, probability of uh, the likelihood of completing on budget should be. And we actually, our board asked us to set that at 90% and our contingency was based on that level of due diligence. Okay. And a uh, more general question, more to the, to the Deputy Minister, just in terms of the province's vision for the Portlands, like what, where do you see the vision for the province? Well, as uh, I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the board had released last year uh, a five-year plan that looked at um, opportunities to uh, do additional fundraising as well and to, uh, to work on four signature areas, uh, the ferry terminal upgrades, the destination playground, which is in Chicago. It's a, a brilliant project that brings all the community in. Uh, we're looking at a signature project, as mentioned, something similar to the Opera House that uh, is a signature uh, um, building in, in Sydney. Uh, so these are things that we're looking at. We're also working with, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we're actually combining our visions together with the CEOs of all the related parties. Uh, so the City of Toronto, the City Manager, myself, uh, uh, Ports uh, Toronto uh, are meeting with uh, all the relevant parties to say how do our plans actually fit together so that we get better synergy. So I think, you know, we have, uh, I'm very proud of the organization and their uh, reputation for the last 18 years. They have demonstrated great innovation. They were uh, leaders in environmental sustainability by putting leads requirements on buildings back in 2009 before anybody else had made that a requirement for a building. So I think we're going to continue to work on sustainability issues, environmental, uh, put more um, public around parks that uh, already uh, in our plans and to expand that opportunity. Uh, I think the key too is to try to activate it during uh, the winter months and how do we get better use out of the uh, out of the facilities collectively uh, during those months so that people can enjoy it year round. And that's part of what we actually ask for is how do we, what are some of the plans to activate uh, the waterfront for the entire year? So I think there's great uh, opportunity. I think there's proven track record for the organizations. I think the positioning, as we mentioned earlier with the intergovernmental committee um, is very strong. I think the reputation of our chair uh, who's been you know, recently appointed and has uh, helped bring forward um, some alignment on the threshold issues. Uh, I think we're in a great position and I'm quite excited, quite frankly, uh, moving forward on these issues. And uh, just following up on that, uh, in terms of winter, what, what are you seeing right now that uh, could drive people there in the winter? Because we obviously have uh, six or seven months of very cold weather in this city and we need to make sure that we util utilize this 12 months. So what are some of the, some of the things that you envision for that? 
Well, uh, Sidewalk has brought forward some uh, areas like uh, these umbrellas that would help protect. Uh, we're, we're not sure how that will work, so we're looking at other things that other jurisdictions have uh, brought forward. But again, even those signature projects, if we can get more you know, activation in terms of buildings down there that would uh, bring uh, families to look at, you know, whether it's museums or activities uh, centers, uh, we need to find more uh, facilities that would attract people uh, for the entire year. I think one of the big issues when you look around the world is usually a very successful waterfront has a number of activities along that waterfront. I think there's opportunity for us to improve on that. That's why we continue to work with the province and looking at what they have in, in mind for Ontario Place. Uh, we, we're not leading that, but we continue to look at how does this all fit together? Because the key is going to be getting the right activities uh, to attract people down there. And then the other part, when we talked about equity in terms of access, um, you know, transit is a big part of our discussion with the city, Metrolinx, and others because we want to make sure everybody can participate in the activities that we do bring forward to the waterfront. Yeah, okay. And to, to the Deputy Minister, I'm just wondering from your point of view, are, are you in alignment with the, these thoughts in terms of how, how you envision this? Absolutely. I, I think I would uh, definitely echo everything that the CEO has said and with respect to the vision and um, add to that that uh, the three levels of government are actually working together to ensure that we can make that vision a reality. So there is there's a lot of cooperation and uh, I echo those remarks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's any questions? Okay. Any further questions from the government side? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank, I want to thank the uh, delegations for coming forward today. Uh, that concludes our time for questions this afternoon, and thank you very much for coming here to committee. Committee members will know that you do have a, um, so you're excused, please feel free to leave. Uh, committee members will know that you have a, excuse me, uh, you have a motion before you that has been served by MPP Tabins. And he's going to read that motion into the record. Thank you, Chair. I move that the committee reconvene in February of 2020 to explore some of the unanswered questions. Excuse me. Excuse me. I, I, if people could please leave quietly and take your conversations outside, I would be very appreciative. I'm going to give. I mean, you're going to start again. And can you please raise your mic up? Thank you very Even much. Even more. Okay. Thank you very much. I move that the committee reconvene in February of 2020 to explore some of the unanswered questions about Waterfront Toronto and in particular questions around the matter of Sidewalk Toronto. Further, that the committee invite Julie DiLorenzo, Michael Nobrega, Helen Bernstein and such others at the recommendation of the Auditor General and the Chair who can provide the necessary information. Thank you very much. Would you, is there I don't need a seconder. There's no seconder required. Would you like to speak to the motion, MPP Tevins? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I, I appreciated the information that was provided to us today, but clearly there were a number of central players who were not available uh, to answer our questions today. Uh, we are talking about a deal that is quite consequential for this province and for this city. Uh, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in precedents that will shape cities for generations to come. And I think that there are questions about political pressure, uh, questions about the IT standards, questions about which land is available and which isn't, and how, in fact, public interest will be protected that need to be answered. Today was a good start, but I think we need at least one other session. Okay, thank you. Any other further comments? MPP Miller? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Tavins, for this motion. It obviously was just dropped on us uh, without any notice, etc. And I have to say I'm of mixed feelings about it because we have a, 19 volumes that we're in the process of trying to select uh, for next year, which I think we're hoping to get those choices done today. Uh, and uh, we, we never have enough time to look at all the various programs that, that are out there. Um, and frankly, uh, I'm just not sure how much value there is in going back to the past Liberal government's, uh, you know, uh, process. Uh, you know, what the, I'm just not sure what the what the value is in uh, in us fully, you know, digging deeper on 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 the, the sidewalks issue. Um, 
you know, I, I think I've mentioned in this committee before, I've, we did a lot, I was chair when we spent a year and a half looking at, uh, at Orange. <laughs> well, um, so I, I mean, yes, this, there, there probably are some questions and the people have you noted probably are the key people that, uh, that are not here today. I'm just, just not sure whether our time would be better spent trying to look at some of the, the some of the uh, aspects of the, uh, the current report. And frankly, you know, I mean, we don't have to have an emotion. We, we, it's common practice of this committee in closed session just to decide have we have a discussion about it and decide whether we have enough answers and yep. whether we want to go forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be okay. a motion. Thank you. MPP Parsa? Uh, Madam Chair, to add to that, we also have another avenue subsequently where we can submit questions as per mm -hmm. uh, procedure that we were explaining earlier then and if we're still not satisfied as a committee that perhaps then we can look at that option uh, subsequently to that yes so I, I think at this point I, I, I obviously mr. Tabins has moved the motion and I prefer not voting it down we obviously have the members to do so um, so I I'd, I'd rather we just have a discussion about it rather than right right now just having a, an immediate vote on the motion um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not ruling out that we'll do what you intend, you know, that you want, what you want to do with this, this motion. I'm not saying. Well, okay. So it's my understanding that, you know, where there's a number of, there's a, a, a number of issues that are before the committee. And so you want to try to find balance with workload. Uh, um, MPP Tabins, are you agreeable to deferring the motion to another conversation or withdrawing it and moving it into a, a conversation? Well, if we move it into a conversation, if we go into closed session, uh, you may or may not be agreeable to it, is what you're saying to me. What I'm saying is I'm, I'm not really prepared to support it. it you know, you just, you just kind of dropped it on us right now. And, it, and you know, I, I don't want to defeat it if I, if I don't have to. <laughs> so, so, so I, I also... I, I also and, but, and the other question I raised as well is that, you know, we're, we're looking at a whole new report. We're trying to decide on sessions. I see the other subcommittee members here uh, to, to look at uh, the various other. To pull back and have a discussion. Thank you very much. That will conclude the uh, public session then of the committee and the, uh, we, the committee will now meet in camera and discuss with the auditor and follow-up questions for the committee. Thank you very much.